This is Bill Newman, WHMP. And this is Buzz Eisenberg. Um, uh, really excited about this segment where Paul Gulla, of the, the gallery manager at Michelson's Galleries here in Northampton, and Jose Baskin, who's Leonard Baskin's son, and an attorney and a rare book dealer here in Northampton, are here to talk about the exhibit at the Michelson's Gallery, uh, Leonard Baskin, a sculptor, a retrospective. And the show is open now, and it'll be open until October 31st. And this Friday at 7 p.m., uh, Rich Michelson and Hosey Baskin will be discussing Baskin's work in the gallery as part of Arts Night Out. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Paul, tell us about this exhibition. That's well, this is a, a retrospective of Leonard's sculpture from the 40s all the way through uh, the 90s. And what we tried to do is take a, a selection of important works on a sort of general theme. And Leonard was, throughout his entire career, you could see themes in his works spanning 40, 50 years. And, and the resistance to oppression was something that he re- returned to again and again and again. You know, in, the, um, in the 40s, he was very much attracted to Marxist ideology um, and read a lot of Marxist books. But even, even that seemed like an oppression to him, even the ideas that he believed in. He was too individualistic for that. So you start to see him resisting that at a very early age. And then it just became a resistance to the oppression of the elite, in addition to oppression of the ruling class. So which theme did you land on for this exhibition? Well, it's the resistance to oppression mm. in general and how it changed over the years from the 40s to the 50s. Oh, I see. And the show is set up. So this is like a survey of his enti- all the resistance. Yep. You go in, you see works from the 40s. It moves into works from the 50s to the 60s. And we talk a little bit about what, what characterized the 40s, what characterized the 50s, how this piece you know, showed how he resisted oppression in the 40s and another piece in the 50s and went through some of his major themes. That sounds really fascinating. Well, one of his most important works is sitting right next to you. <laughs> <laughs> Hosey, how, how is it to be uh, part of this exhibition in your own hometown featuring your father's work? It's, it's great to have it up and to, I mean, there are still so many people here in Northampton, uh, who remember Leonard and uh, who knew him personally. Uh, He died in 2000, but he lived here for almost 50 years. Mm. Um, Brooklyn born, but, or no, sorry, New Jersey born, Brooklyn raised, but uh, from fairly early adulthood, he made his home here in the Valley. Um, What was your relationship growing up to your father's work? um, It was just part of our life. the studio was right next to the house. Um, I grew up clambering over pieces of sculpture. Uh, and I remember it being very strange going to a museum and seeing his work and not being able to climb on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> you didn't get a special dispensation from the museum staff when you were there with Leonard? Not so much. Oh, wow. So j- just a word of advice. When this opens uh, at, at the... Uh, at the uh, Michelson Gra- Gallery on Friday. Do not clamber over his work. I'm more restrained now than I was then. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, it's harder to climb now. Than Absolutely. <laughs> um. yeah, the, um, the, the, the great thing about this show is you really see Leonard's dedication to these central themes, you know, and how he was almost unwavering, you know, and, and he was resisting what was happening at the time. You know, in the 50s, Everybody was all about abstract expressionist, Mm. and he was always on the outside. And even on the outside, he made a huge name for himself, getting museum shows. Um, The MoMA put him in a show in 1959, really is, you know, because he was an outsider. And and he became an important outsider, and he became known very early for being a resistor. And he never stopped being a resistor until the day he died. So when it came to curating this show, how were decisions made about what gets placed where and the relationship among the pieces? Well, I think, you know, you can, some pieces exhibit these themes better because Leonard was constantly moving and he constantly had these ideas. But he would, in the 50s, he... he did, did you know Leonard? I did know Leonard. Mm. Yeah, he would chastise me on a regular basis. <laughs> um, also, come in. I, that would, must be familiar to you, Hosey, as his son, right? Not so much. He <laughs> was, um, 
<laughs> he cut his family more slack. Than... <laughs> That's good to hear, though. Yes. <laughs> it is. Um, but he was always right, so what can I say? Yeah. Um, but, but I think that there were, there were some major series that he would do, and we tried to represent that as much as possible. Um, you know, he did a series of dead men in the 50s, which, you know, he was very influenced by Egyptian sculpture. But these were important people. The Egyptians were important emperors and kings and... and Actually, let me... It, it was less the Egyptian. It was um, after the war on the GI Bill, he went to study in Paris and um, saw in the cathedrals in Paris these sculptures of dead people um, and, you know, tomb sculptures. And mm. there'd be the person buried... Arms uh, folded over yeah, the exactly. Chest. Arms folded. The person would be buried underneath and on top would be a beautiful sculpture of the dead person mm. uh, as though they were sleeping. Um, and he was struck that these were incredible works of sculpture, but they were only the powerful. It was the archbishops and the cardinals, the kings, the queens, the princes. Not the peons. And he decided to create a series of, uh, the French word for them is gisants, um, of common people. And that was when he started doing this series of dead men. Um, it wasn't a morbid thing. It was a, an effort to acknowledge a group of people who had been ignored when all of the attention was on the wealthy and the powerful. Yeah. Which dead men did he choose to do? Were they actual dead men? Were they No, they were figurative people he wanted dead? <laughs> Nobody. Yeah, right. They were unnamed unnamed people. Unnamed um there was a and he kept up with this theme all the way through. Often he would get into a theme and then and it would become central to his work. And then it would periodically reoccur over the years. Um, so there's a sculpture from the 80s that is four or five almost life-size dead, a row of dead people. Mm. Uh, and it's called The Unnoticed Dead. Mm. Uh, so part of the point of it is the anonymity, that right. the people who built the cathedrals, we don't know their names. Mm. They're unnoticed, unremembered, mm -hmm. unmemorialized, and he felt that they should be memorialized. So uh, gallery manager Paul Gullo, what medium, or when, we, when this opens on Friday the 13th at 7 o'clock, what medium are we going to see? Well, a lot of them were bronzes. You know, they were, um, from early on, we have a piece that he, he cast in his backyard um, from you know before he was working with foundries, uh, from whatever metals he could he could find, and then um, there were some how wood did he, pieces. How did he smelt? Yeah. Yeah. he smelled yeah. pretty good, yeah. <laughs> like roses. <laughs> you know, he wore cologne. Um, it was, um, you know, he was interested in the the mechanics and the technology of creating these works. Wow. It was, um, though, not that interested. Once he was successful enough to work with a, a real foundry, and he had a long relationship with a foundry in New York, mm -hmm. uh, same people who cast the Iwo Jima Memorial wow. um, in what used to be the roughest part of Greenpoint, and it's bizarre, now there's like sushi next door. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in the early days, he would do it himself. I love when um, those foundry workers go next door for sushi. sushi. It's great. Um, and... Um, yeah, so the, it's, was he a handy guy? Yeah, yeah he, he had excellent. Uh, so around he, the house, he just sort of uh, used those skills to fix. No, nah, not the plumbing. so much. Not so much. No, um, but he I, knew what to tell other people to fix. I yes. see, um, and to correct them when they're doing it wrong. <laughs> there you go. Um, my guess is, if if he'd set his mind to, he probably could have. But yeah. w what he really loved to do was create art. Yeah. And it was amazing watching him work that he would, you know, get up in the morning, late, have breakfast, make art, stop for lunch, go down to the look restaurant, have, have a bite to eat, come back and make more art. After dinner, make more art. He'd stay up until three in the morning making art, crash and get up at 1030 and start the whole thing all over again. Making art was his passion. It was the thing that he wanted to do. And... Um, 
why fix the plumbing when you could be making art? That's a um, really good question. Right I, up I have to remember tell that. that. <laughs> yeah. right I'm going to tell my wife that. <laughs> right up until four hours before he died on his deathbed. Is that and he was still right? drawing. Wow. Yeah, he requested yeah. some paints because he had a dream and he wanted to capture it. Wow, that is an artist. It was artist, just who he was. He was just a force of will. Wow. Did he impart any of that to you other than your love of art, your skills? Um. Not so much. You're a rare book dealer. I'm a rare book dealer, and um, that definitely came from him. He was the one thing he would willingly give up making art for was to go poke around antique stores and old bookstores. Uh, he was a collector and um, a passionate collector, and that was one of the few things that he would put down the mallet and chisel or the paintbrushes. To go do. Is there a collector's gene that gets passed on? Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. definitely. I don't know. Is it heredity or environment? Whichever way it was. Oh, I'm sorry. I, it's too I early had, to raise that question. I, I had. I got it from both sides. So, yeah, yeah there was yeah. no escape. Well, Every time I would go down to New York, he would. Um, I'd pick up something to drop off at the foundry, and he'd say, "Oh, while, while you're down there, um, here, go to this address, and she'll have something for you." I mean, nearly every time, and I never knew if I was picking up a book or a table, you know, and he just said, yeah, pick it up and show She'll have something for you. She'll have yeah. something for you. Yeah. Oh. Wow. So. I, I've represented people who said, I didn't know what was in there. <laughs> 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 Always had an out. Yeah. Um, but but the, the, show, the show has a nice mix of, of mediums. We, we've done bronzes, we've done wood pieces, um, and there are some watercolors and graphics uh, and you know, prints to show how those themes went through the rest of his work as well. So uh, it, visually, it's it's really quite beautiful. And, and the really theme see. is such an important one. It is. It is especially in 2019. Especially at this yeah. moment. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm sort of glad that he's not here to see where we are right now. Yeah, I I think that all the time about you know so many people who are. Uh, either mentors or models for me, uh, you know, progressive giants that I'm so glad they're not here to see this because we always thought we were progressing in one direction and just too many steps back right now. Absolutely. Yeah, it could that's take a couple, but not like such giant leaps. That's why we still need art. That's why it's important to be there on Friday. Tell us about the opening. Uh, Seven o'clock on Friday night, uh, Hosey Baskin and Richard Michelson will be having a discussion about Leonard and his work and, They'll talk about their personal recollections. You know, Rich has been handling Leonard's work since 85, so they have a long friendship. Um, and I'm sure there'll be some question and answers uh, as well. So uh, it'll be a nice sort of casual discussion, and who knows where it'll go. But it'll be about Leonard. So. Can people see it on a website? We will likely film it and put it on our website afterwards. Which is what? Um, rmichelson.com. Gentlemen, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for coming in this morning. It's Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Great. We'll be right back after the break with Black in the Valley. This is Bill Newman, WHMP. Oh, the streets of Rome.